Today, I'm going to be talking to you about these, the new Scout HD FPV goggles from Fat Shark. Now, the Scout HDs are the first goggles from Fat Shark to have their Shark Bite digital FPV system built in as standard. If you don't know what Shark Bite is, it is a digital FPV system based on HD0 technology from DiviMath, and it allows you to get up to 720p, 60 frames a second HD footage via this system. Now, in today's video, I'm going to give you a complete overview, tear down and review of these new Scout HD goggles, but I'm also going to be talking about some other stuff around the Shark Bite and HD Zero system as well. For instance, the footage I will be showing you in this video has been taken on the new HD Zero camera, and whilst it's not a review, I will be talking a little bit about that as well. We're also using the new TX5 R.1 video transmitter as well, and I'm going to show you a little bit of the new build that I've been using too. Now, this video is going to be quite long because there is a lot to cover here. As I said, we're going to look at the goggles, tear them down and give you a complete overview of where we're at. And then at the end, I'm going to give you my thoughts. Now, just to be clear, I have bought these goggles and everything you see here. My opinions are entirely my own and they are based on my own experience. I am also doing no comparison in this video with other systems. This is all about this, what you see in front of me here, and I'm going to give you my opinions on where we are at with this today. Anyway, let's get on with this video and let's take a look at the new Scout HDs first of all. The Scout HDs are the first goggles from Fat Shark to have their Shark Bite digital FPV system built in as standard. However, not only are they a first to have this digital FPV system, they also are the beginnings of a new push into lower cost HD FPV. For instance, the Scout HDs, when paired with the 200 milliwatt Shark Bite transmitter and the Runcam Nano HD camera, can all be bought for under 350 and this brings HDFPV into a whole new price bracket that we've not seen it in before. Taking a closer look at the Scout HDs themselves, as I've said, these are the first goggles from Fat Shark to have their Shark Bite digital FPV system built in. It is also worth noting that these are digital only goggles and there is no analog receiver. Now, because these are Scouts, they are a box style goggle and they weigh 336 grams. They feature a single lens design which allows you to view through to a 1080p 3.5 inch display. It has a fixed IPD of 55 to 76 mil and a 44 degree field of view. The Scout HDs feature a built-in digital DVR with a micro SD card slot located just above the eyepiece. Now it is worth mentioning that this is a HD DVR on these goggles and it is not the same kind of DVR that you may have had on other goggles from Fat Shark in the past. Looking around the goggles externally, on the front you'll find a large flat area and this is where the two built-in right-hand circular polarised patch antennas are located inside. Looking on the left, you'll find a firmware update port for updating your VTX and on the right you'll find a DC input jack. These goggles can be powered from 2 to 4S or up to 16 volts max via the included cable. Looking on the top, you'll find three control buttons as well as two additional SMA ports. These goggles support up to four antennas in total, allowing you to put two of your own antennas via the SMAs. The controls are fairly simple and you simply have a return button as well as an up and down button and we'll show that a little bit more later on in the video as we're looking at the menus. Taking a look at what you get in the box, you'll find the goggles themselves as well as a soft cloth for cleaning the removable lens. There's also some additional padding for around the nose area, the power cable, some Fat Shark stickers, as well as a three-way head strap with Velcro adjustments. Now just one thing to note on this is the power cable they supply is very similar to the power cable on other systems as well as the one they supplied with the Shark Bite receiver when using via HDMI. It is worth noting though that it is different and this one should only be used with the goggles and it should not be used with any additional Shark Bite systems you may have. 
Talking about how these goggles fit and feel, they do come pre-fitted with some nice soft padding already installed. However, you'll notice that there is none around the nose area, but they do include a piece that you can add yourself should you wish to do so. Now, just taking these goggles apart to show you what they're like inside, to get into them you need to remove the padding from around the side which reveals some screw holes located around the faceplate area. There are two under the bottom on either side and two along the top on either side. Once you remove this it allows you to pull the front of the goggles off which reveals the PCB on the top with the antennas located on the front and the coax coming over. Now here you can clearly see the two large built-in right hand circular polarized patch antennas and it's a nice little touch that they actually have little shark logos on these even though they are inside. On the left you'll find the built-in cooling fan which not only cools the internal electronics but it also provides airflow over the lens of the goggles itself too. Now to remove the box section you simply remove these two additional screws and this will then release the actual optical assembly with the PCB located on the top and here you can see that internal mirror that reflects the actual image to the display which is located horizontally at the top of the goggles themselves. Taking a closer look at the main PCB, here you can see the custom ASICs from Divimath. These are the DM5680Ts and these are the main chipset as part of the HD0 digital FPV system that does the encoding and decoding. We have a Spartan 6 FPGA as well as two analog devices transceivers that are used to handle all of the RF side of things for the antennas as well as the main RF receiver. Reception. There's also what looks to be a multi controller from Star, which is next to the micro SD card slot. That may be handling some firmware, but it might also be dealing with the onboard recording as well. Overall, the internal electronics appear well made and I don't see anything of any concern. One thing just to note is that the two internal patch antennas are connected via UFL ports and I did find that my left hand one had a very tight cable and it actually kept popping the UFL connector off when I was trying to reassemble the goggles. It would have been nice if they'd have put just a little bit of adhesive or silicon on this just to stop them popping off in assembly. I don't think think it will be a problem in use but it just was something that I noticed on mine. Okay so what I want to do next is walk you through some of the menus and options that are available on the Scout HD goggles. Now these goggles don't have HDMI output so what I'm going to do is actually show you this via the Fast Shark module because basically the menu system on these is exactly the same. The goggles module has a couple of extra options that the Scout HDs don't and I'll talk about them as we walk through but basically this will allow me to do it over HDMI and record it. Now, at the moment, I've got the Runcam Nano camera set up with the new HD0 lens, and that's what you're actually looking at me through right now. And this will allow me to actually enter the menu and walk you through that that way. Now, before we take a proper look at that, I just want to mention something that I haven't spoke about yet, is the fact that this system works more like analog the way the ear side or the VTX connects to the ground unit. Basically, there is no binding, there is no linking, you have your VTX on the channel you want to transmit on, you put your receiver module on the channel you want to receive on, and as long as they're the same, you will get an image. This means you can use as many receiving modules as you want. You can use one, you can use two, it doesn't matter. They can be on the same channel and multiple people can look at the same image and you don't have to worry about anything like binding or anything like that. So to walk you guys through the menus, what I'm going to do is enter the main menu screen and here you can see the list appear in front of us. At the top, we've got the option to scan and this will simply tell the goggles or the module to scan all the channels and lock on just like it has there. So for instance, if I do that again and if I actually turn off the A side module a second and then tell it to scan again, you'll see this time it doesn't pick anything up because I've turned it off. 
If I tell it to rescan, it just simply shows nothing. You have a nice spectrum analyzer screen, which has the channels one to eight, and it simply just shows you that we're not picking up anything. If I then now turn the module back on and give it a second, it'll actually scan automatically again, or I will tell it to do it, and boom, it's locked onto it, and we've gone straight back into the main screen. Going back into the menu, the next two options, which is HDMI output and aspect ratio, these are only available on the Fat Shark module and not the Scout HDs. There is no HDMI output on the Scout HD and there is no option to change the aspect ratio. This is simply limited to the goggles module, so you can select 720p or 1080p and 4x3 or 16x9 on the module only. Next, moving down to playback, this allows you to playback the files that you've got recorded on the SD card. So here you can see some of the files that I recorded earlier as I was already making this video. If I play on it, you can see that's me talking earlier. So it just allows you to nice and easily play back the footage that you've previously recorded. The next option is to format SD card, which does what it says. Simply format the SD card ready to use in the system. We have record mode, whether it be manual or auto. Auto will just start recording the second you put an SD card in or you power on the module, whereas manual, you actually have to trigger recording yourself. You then have the record format. Now, the latest firmware supports both the TS format and movie format. TS is better if you're going to be doing things just like pulling the power cable out the side of the goggles because it will still work. Whereas the movie format, you will need to make sure that you stop recording before powering down. Otherwise, the file won't get finished and it will be corrupt. So you can choose the one that best suits your needs. You have the option to record the OSD. Now, this is the OSD sent to the system via your flight controller and the ear unit. So this is the MSP OSD, canvas mode, etc. You can tell it to record it onto the DVR or not record it, depending on the option you want. We've got the option to turn auto scan on or off. We have antenna diagnostics. Now, this is a really nice little feature that shows you the bar graphs and it just shows you the performance of each of the antennas. You can see here on the module, it simply shows you it like that. And then on the goggles, it just shows you it with a slightly different picture, but the performance is basically the same. Moving down, we've then got the option for the VRX OSD and you can turn this on and off. And just to show you what this is, this OSD is the one you can see up here in the top right hand corner. This is the OSD that shows the signal level from each of the antenna inputs, as well as the record indicator, which is the little gray round circle. So if I tell the unit to record, you will see that that goes red and that is now on the display. So what that option is, is simply the option to show that or not. The final option at the bottom is the about one, and that simply shows you the current information about the system, including the firmware version. So looking over the menus, you can see that it is fairly easy and straightforward. And as I've said, the only real difference between the menu on the Scout HDs and the module is the fact that the Scout HDs don't have the HDMI output and they don't have the 16 by nine option, as you've seen there, but pretty much everything else is exactly the same. Okay, so it's time to show you guys a bit of footage. Now, I've recorded everything you're about to see on a new SharkBite build, which is using the new HD0 camera from DiviMath. This is the one which is the micro HD that is in beta and is going to be out in the near future. This is paired up with the TXR 5.1 200 milliwatt transmitter. And then I've got a pair of Menace Pagoda antennas on this build initially. Just to make sure you understand, the footage we have here has been recorded on the HD0 camera with the SharkBite DVR. And that has then been upscaled from 720p to 1080p via the superscale feature in DaVinci Resolve. Now, this is just some basic flying. There's loads of race footage out there. There's tons of people shooting gates and all of that. So what I wanted to do is put together some very basic, easy flight footage to give you an idea of how this system looks and what my thoughts are on it. Now, with regards to this new camera, I have to say I do like it. The colors are good. The auto white balance behavior is good. And overall, it gives a real nice image. There is quite a bit of fisheye on the lens on it, but that is to be expected with the lens it's got fitted.
Now, moving over to talking about the Shark Bite goggles, which are the Scout HDs and the overall feel of the system. I have to say, the image quality on these goggles is really, really good on the screens. In fact, the DVR footage does not do it justice. In flight, the goggles have a decent field of view. I would have preferred it a bit more immersive, but overall, it is good and you soon get used to it, especially if you've been using the other goggles. Now, there is some interesting behavior that I have found on these goggles when in flight, and that is that the patch antennas are extremely directive. And I'm finding that the patch antennas seem to be the primary antennas used even when I've got some Omnis installed. Even at close range, I was finding that I had to stay very on target with the patches. And even with two Omnis on the top at close range, if I turned away from the aircraft, the signal would drop off quite substantially and you'd begin to get that little sort of analog style breakup on the screen. Now, I originally did wonder if this was an issue with the antennas I was using. So whilst the footage you're seeing here is on the Menace Pagodas, I did go out and get myself a set of singularities from TrueRC and did some more tests with them just to see what the behavior was like. I can't 100% say it's much better. This footage here is now with the TrueRC antennas. Again, two singularities on the goggles, one long, one short, with a single singularity on the VTX. Range-wise, I'm not going to give you figures, but I was getting fairly good range on this setup, and that should be added. Yes, you can see it start to break up a little bit with the digital signal, but overall, I have to say, I was getting quite decent performance, especially when the aircraft was pointing away from me. But again, I do want to stress that I was finding it extremely directive. Now, the rest of this footage is simply really just to show you the system in slightly different environments. So we've got some grass to show you how it looks in very, very similar colored environments, how it looks at lower level and higher level too. Really, I don't have a lot of complaints personally with how HD0 looks. And I will say one more time, it does look much better in the goggles than you are seeing on the DVR footage. The DVR really doesn't do it justice. It looks quite tidy indeed when you are looking at it through the goggles. Here you can see that there's plenty of detail, especially when I land, you can see that it is clearly a HD image. Okay, so to give you my thoughts on the Scout HDs, as well as talk a bit more about the HD0 SharkBite system. Now, concentrating on the goggles, first of all, from a personal point of view, I quite like these, and there is a lot to like considering the price point. For $250, you're getting a set of digital FPV goggles with a built-in DVR, high-quality 1080p screen, and multiple antenna options. The overall weight and size of the goggles is nice. It's not too big. The screen is is really quite nice. The image quality is quite crisp and it does a great job of upscaling that 720p footage from the camera up to 1080p and there's no sign of any issues with the upscaling and it just looks as you would expect. The DVR on this is okay in my opinion. The image quality is still better in the goggles than actually on the DVR but it is a proper digital DVR and hopefully we'll see some more improvements on that as time goes on. Now, whilst there is a lot to like here, there is some downsides to these goggles as well. And there's a few compromises that I think do make them a bit of a questionable purchase. For instance, they don't have analog. And that for me is the biggest mistake with these goggles I think Fat Shark have made. They appear to be aimed at the budget market, allowing people to get into digital FPV cheaper than ever before. Because remember, you can get these for $250, the camera and VTX for $100, which allows you to get a full digital FPV system for $350. And that is much cheaper than we've seen. However, 
it is forcing you digital and it just restricts the options that you have. I would have much preferred they had increased the price by $50 and put analog in or allow a bay on the side for plug a module in. There's not even an AV in on these. So analog is not an option. You are restricted to shark bite digital only. Alongside that, there are a few other little minor things I think should be improved. For instance, they are quite noisy when in use because of the built-in fan. Yes, they're as loud as the, the system, not louder, but that system's too loud and I would have liked to have seen this one a bit quieter as well. They do run hot when they're in use. There's quite a bit of heat comes out the top. And whilst I haven't had any issues with the lens setup myself, you can see the reflections in the menu. Personally, it's not an issue. It's only when you're in the menu system do you see the reflections off the internal glass, but it is something some people have picked up on. I personally have not seen it in flight and it's a non-issue for me, but it is something I did want to mention. One other thing I do want to mention around as well is the antenna setup on these. They are very directive. So you've got the two patch antennas built into the front and you do need to make sure that you stay dead on target, especially when flying a little bit at range. You do have the two SMAs for the extra antennas, but I'm personally finding the goggles seem to latch on the uh, patches more than the SMAs with the Omnis. I'm finding even at short range, the Omnis don't really seem to be doing anything and it is all on the patch antennas. And because they're dead straight and they're not actually angled out, they do have a narrower field of view. And what you will find when you're flying is you do have to keep them dead on the aircraft, especially at range, and even a slight move out either way, you start to get breakup. On the module, they actually tilted the antennas out slightly on the patches to allow them to actually get a slightly wider field of view, and they probably should have done that on this. Inside, the PCB antenna is completely flat, and that's what's making it a bit narrower overall. Hopefully, we'll try and understand a bit more about how the antenna setup works on these, because we don't fully understand it, but for me, they do appear to be latched on that patches rather than the Omnis more than anything. Overall, I have to say though, for $250, they are a really decent budget set of goggles. And if you're someone who wants to get into digital FPV and you don't have a set of FPV goggles, they are well worth a look. Now, for me, there is some questions of who they are designed for though, because at the moment, HD0, or Sharkbite as I should be calling it, it's the same system, is being pushed more than anything towards racing. I'm not saying it can only be used for racing, but the real push on this system right now is to replace analog in sort of a racing environment. You can fly Bando, you can fly traditional FPV, you can do medium range, no problem at all on this system, but its primary focus appears to be racing, and I'm just not convinced these goggles are aimed at a racing market. They're more for me aimed at a new into FPV market, but there are some compromises on the HD Zero system or Sharkbite that hopefully will be improved to make them a more viable option in that sense. I don't see people who are owning a set of HDO2s getting a set of these instead. People with goggles with HDMI input are just going to choose the module because you can get that for $99 at some places right now. So they are a bit confusing, mostly because they don't have the analog built in. If they had analog, it would be a no brainer. It's just the fact that there isn't analog, it does, it sort of, for me, it gives me mixed feelings who they're for and what market they're aimed at, other than budget introduction into digital FPV. Now, to talk a bit about where HD0 is at today, or Sharkbite is at, because HD0 and Sharkbite are the same system. HD0 are the chipset manufacturers, and Sharkbite is the name of the whole system via Fat Shark. Now, 
This system has been quite stagnant for the last year or so. Sharkbite has been out for a while and we saw very little change. However, in the last few months, a lot of stuff has been happening. We've got the new VTX, which is the TX5R.1, which I've got in this quad here. We've got these new goggles. We've got the new HD0 camera, which I've got the beta of it in here as well. And the system has been having very regular updates via firmware from DiviMath, as well as updates from fat shark on where they intend it to go now my opinion on this system as of today is as follows and i just want to put this out there now not everyone is going to agree with this this is as i am personally finding it today from a latency point of view this system is fantastic it is fixed it doesn't change and that is one of the major benefits of this system as it stands today its downsides for me in my personal testing is penetration and range. Now, with regards to range, I can actually get quite a substantial distance on this system with the patches on this goggle. So range is achievable. However, it's the penetration element that I'm personally finding that the system lacks in. For instance, if I fly behind even very narrow hedges, it starts to break up. When you're flying at range and you are not dead on or you turn the aircraft off, unless your goggles are perfectly on it, it starts to break up. The system just has very little overhead unless everything is perfect. Now, it is very much designed that way and we should see some improvements on that come in the near future because there are rumors of a one watt VTX around the corner. And it's worth always remembering that the other system is capable up to 1200 milliwatts and a lot of people are flying at that. So it's very unfair to compare one to the other when they're not capable of the same power. I'm looking forward to seeing where this ends up with more power. Carl at DiviMath has also said some really interesting stuff around some improvements that could be made for the penetration side of things via reducing the frame rate or changing the camera settings so for instance if they were able to go for 720p 30 frames a second it would allow reduction in bandwidth and that would improve range and penetration as well however it's going to be interesting to see with this one what vtx takes it because that's a lot more power and that might be able to overcome some of the shortcomings that some of us are finding now there are people who are having no problems with penetration at all on this system. I can only give you my opinion based on my own tests. I've tried multiple antennas. I've tried all different setups. It's not terrible, but I am of the opinion that it does lack in the areas, even compared to analog at places, based on the testing that I have done. Now, this system, though, is really in its stride from a development point point of view right now, and it is moving forward all of the time, and it's placed itself at a point that no other digital FPV system has been at. For instance, they just dropped the price of the goggles module on offer down to $99. So if you had a set of goggles with the HDMI input, you could use that. We've now got these for $250, and as I've already said, you can get a full digital setup for $350. And that is just half the cost of the other equivalent FPV system. My personal advice on HD0 and Sharkbite today is this. If you're into racing and you want to go digital, it's a no-brainer. Get into it, see how you get on and try it. If you're into Bando and traditional FPV, it's going to get be mixed results for you depending on the areas you fly. If you're flying around a lot of foliage, you're going to find that penetration issue, especially if it's wet and damp. Around concrete areas could give you issues as well. If you're into long range, this really isn't for you yet, but don't think this system can't do decent range, especially if you're completely line of sight, because it will. And, and it really can offer some really nice image quality as well. I'm looking forward as well to seeing how this new camera turns out. Now, I do have the beta one here, but there's more improvements coming on that and more changes in the future as well. My overall thought on this is this. If you want to get into HD FPV on the cheapest possible price, this system is well worth a look. If you want out and out range, you want to consider the other one. But if you want to support a system that is developing and moving forward, if you're happy 
to wait for some of the other features like out and out range and penetration, it is worth taking a look and worth considering jumping in now. And that is it from me. Now, please let me know what you think about this video, this system, your thoughts. I'm really interested in your comments and feedback and do put them in the comment section of this video and let me know what you think. Now, I'd like to thank you all for spending some time with me on this one. If you'd like to support the channel to enable us to keep making content like this, because we do buy all our own equipment when we're talking about it on stuff like this. And if you'd like to support us to be able to do that, there are links to buy me a coffee as well as Patreon in the description of this video. Also, if you want to hear more, there is a link to my Discord server as well, where you can come over and say hi. And again, as I've already said, if you have found it interesting, please do consider hitting that subscribe button as well, because by doing that, you will get updates on any new videos that we put out in the future. Anyway, that's it from me. Please do let me know what you think, and I will speak to you guys again soon.